here's it. Uh, we have all the members here, and uh, it's five o'clock. So I will open the public hearing or the uh, remote meeting. Uh, first thing on the agenda is call to order, which I've just done, and discussion of the LTA grant submissions. Would that be you, Judy? I guess so. Um, actually, it's Brian Domina. Every year, FERCA gets money which can be used for grants to support their work on various projects and town commissions and boards get to apply. And I circulated the criteria, which I wasn't smart enough to print out, unfortunately. Um, last year, and, and the select board prioritizes, but I think the planning board always gets something. Last year, we, we asked for help with the floodplain by, bylaw, which we got, and for research on batteries. And I was never clear to me, battery storage, that is, was never clear to me whether we actually got funding for that or grant funding for that or not. I think in, as the year progressed, we didn't have time to work on it anyway. So it became kind of a moot point. Um, in thinking about it, the one topic that I came up with was that something I've been dreading even thinking about for a long time, but our subdivision bylaws are hopelessly out of date. Those of us who worked on Pine Plains know that we had to waive a sidewalk requirement. The, our road requirement was too wide for today's smart growth things. We, uh, the bylaws require storm drains and that's not a good smart growth. Anyway, there are a lot of energy and environmental practices that are not allowed for in our bylaws. They require street lights, which the town doesn't like. Um, and I know that there were inconsistencies that were driving John Robleski crazy. It's not a trivial task to re revise the, by the regulations. And so I was wondering if we might put in a request to have them review them and make recommendations about what should be changed rather than sort of initiating a whole, they could give us a template to start from so that, so that we could then undertake it or work with them next year on that or something. But that, would, that was the one topic I thought of. I don't, maybe we wanna circle back to this after we go through some of the potential bylaw changes because maybe we'll want help there. Sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. I, I do like that idea. Um, I wasn't aware that we, I lost track of the fact we previously asked for funding on battery storage. So, but if I, my intuition is that we had to prioritize, I'd probably prioritize help on subdivision regulations, but yeah, we should, we can move I'm, this to I'm the not end. Sure that, I'm not sure that FERCOG would be much help on battery storage, the more that I thought about it. Um, we can get other towns bylaws just from a listserv and I don't think they can do any research better than other sources we might have so but and, anyway we're getting into okay getting ahead of so that's that's all I have for thoughts okay great okay so we'll, we'll move this to the end of the agenda because we do want to get something in and the deadline is Friday unless they extend it. Okay, the review of uh, necessary zoning map changes and implementation. Yeah, so that's me. Um, I can share my screen. So I'll give you, um, while I'm sharing my screen, I'll give you a little bit of background on this. Um, so we, uh, there's a resource available to us for free at FERCOG uh, GIS, Geographical Information System Specialist, who can help us 
make changes to our various zoning maps. There had been various asks of us in 2022, and I believe they haven't been satisfied yet. And I've tried in what I'm sharing here, I went through all my notes and emails to try to compile my list of what I think the things that have been asked of us. And what I hope to do is get some consensus tonight on the things that need done, make sure we all understand what we're really talking about here. And then I would forward those over to this FERCOG resource. There is one thing, and this is directed to you, Don, uh, the FERCOG resource wants any existing shape files uh, that we may already have. So if you have any shape files, then you should send them to me so I can get them over to FERCOG on this. Well, unfortunately, what I've got includes more stuff than the shape files, and it's too large for me to um, actually email. So okay. I, have, I have put those on a uh, thumb drive, and I'm going to go up to FERCOG and talk directly to uh, Eric, is his name? Ryan. Ryan Clare. Ryan, Ryan. 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 Um, so uh, I was going to do that today, but it was a little bit too much snow for me. So okay, and well that's great. So, so the other thing, the other thing is that uh, in the latest thing that I have, uh, all those corrections have been made. Okay, are done as far as parcel twelve zero twenty four two. Okay, so Don, you, how many? Do you have all of the aquifer overlay districts on that map, including the very tiny ones around the wells? Yes. Okay. Although the well ones need to be removed. Uh, you can't do that without a town meeting vote. Actually, no. I don't, that's the question I have of how much we can do with, because the mistakes, well, the map needs to be fixed anyway, but I don't know whether we can initiate it without getting another town meeting vote. Well, nobody's, that water can't be used, so. I know, but it, this is, it's not, it's not a function of, um, it's, it's not a, a function of, of the wells themselves, it's a function of the process of approving the maps and, and the zoning. Okay. So it seems like the goal is to, so Don to get this material over to FERCOG, FERCOG to make changes, obviously then those changes, I think what you're saying is the planning board needs to give to the select board to present at this coming town meeting, new, a new zoning map or set of zoning maps. It's not been clear in my head whether given all the different overlays, we wanna just have or should have one single map with everything or different maps that show only individual over, overlays, you know, like, because I heard there was a readability concern with the map when all the different overlays were depicted simultaneously. Well, I think that would be up to Ryan to advise us on. Well, if people go to the map online, you can turn those things off and on. Sure, for but the online is not the gold standard. It's the, right? it's the written, we need a, an official written map printed. Yeah. I realize that but when you when you if you need to look at it without with other things missing, you can print it out from from the uh, from the web. Okay. Yeah, well, there was concern about Brian. Brian Donna had concern about the background. Well, he claimed that um, because some of the barns are shown on there and they're no longer there was his biggest complaint to me. And uh, we tried using aerial photographs and. Those did not work well at all. Uh, and there are no newer, newer quad sheets. 
um, that we can actually put in in there that um, I was able to find downloadable. Brent, could you put a question mark after you need to have voted it at a town meeting? Because sure. if, I think it's got to do with whether, uh, what I'm remembering is that statement that Mrs. Monahan made that the, the AG's letter of approval said that the map had been approved. Right, right. Um, if that weren't the case, then the map has been basically, every, every time we voted, zoning change, then, then that, that change is implicitly approved in the map. But I think that because of that wording, that the mistakes have been approved. Okay. <laughs> but I'm not 100% sure that's why I said it. Um, so maybe somebody could check with either Amy or Brian. I will take the action to check with town officials regarding what we believe is the approved and official zoning map. I believe that when we asked for the approval, we, we, we enumerated what we thought we were get, getting approved that were changed, but I'm not sure. But I gather Judy saying there is a separate voting step where an actual printed map has to be included in the town meeting warrant, which also I think implies well, itself. I don't think it has to, but I think the problem is that I'm not sure whether Amy sent the whole map along with the, the minutes of the meeting. Okay. Because the AG's approval letter said that the map had been approved, not that the zoning changes had been approved. Okay. Previously, well, we just I think we should close piece this. by piece by piece. I will yeah. follow up with town officials to sort of and, and come back to the board with a report on the status of the zoning map. But I believe that whatever the map is, it's got errors. So there's two things we need to do. We need to correct the map. And my, what I'm hearing is Don is going to take a thumb drive of data to FERCOG at his earliest opportunity, and we'll get a, a, a new map put together. And the second issue is, does that map need to go through some kind of formal approval process? I will ascertain the answer to the second question. Okay. Thank you. So I think we can close this topic for now. Okay, next item is discussion of potential zoning law changes, including the flood plan, flood plain, battery storage, um, solar bylaw revisions and cannabis social clubs. So I'd like to hear from Judy on the floodplain bylaw. I inserted that into the agenda because I want to just get it, get caught up on where we are and what we might be planning to do in 2023. And I can deal with the other three topics, subtopics under this area. So Judy? Uh, well, we have been notified by the by, the, by Brian and Amy that we are due for a, what's called a monitoring meeting, National Federal Insurance Board monitoring meeting, um, which is held periodically. Our last one was in 2008, where they review our status with the floodplain bylaw. And this will be a meeting that it will include the building inspector, members of the planning board, um, Brian, um, Keith. Um, I don't know if there's a zoning person involved or not. Um, large cast of characters. It's set for February 6th in the afternoon. It will be a virtual meeting. 
and they will answer questions and help us uh, understand if we have any questions about the flood insurance program, et cetera. And my guess is that that will be a good place to, to determine the next steps on this. Um, we have a draft. Where we were is trying to clarify how this is best communicated to the public. Um, it appeared we weren't ready when we had our public hearing because we didn't have enough information about the regulations. I haven't talked, I had hoped Hannah was talking to Scott and I didn't get, I don't think she had any time to work on it uh, in, in the fall. We, oh, I've left out a step. We had delayed pursuing this on the belief that we were gonna get a re revised FEMA map over the summer. And this did not happen. I mean, once again, I think this is the third time we've been told we get a new FEMA map within six months and it still hasn't happened. And we'll, we delayed because it seemed kind of silly to, to go through with a bylaw and then have to change it instantly to reflect a new map. Um, we were of course going to work on things in the interim and, and that didn't happen. So my guess is from, from brief comments that Scott made and I apologize, I haven't confirmed this with him but I think it will come out at this February 6th meeting is that he would, his normal process would be to wait to get regulations to get the bylaw in place and then develop regulations. Because if you think about it, it's kind of hard to do that without the bylaw there. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we have a communication problem that we need the regulations to sort of educate people on this ahead of time. Right. Right. Um, the other issue that occurred to me when, when the woman from Boston, whose name I've forgotten now, um, doesn't matter. Joy was talking. It seemed like a lot of the things that we had worried about, she was calling de minimis. And that maybe this isn't as onerous a thing as, as I had thought. And maybe we have overreacted in the education need. Um, I don't know whether any of you got that impression or not. Um, I was a little worried that almost anything anybody did was going to have to be reviewed. I, after listening to her, I wasn't so sure about that anymore. Um, we also, I don't think, are going to get any more clarification on the interplay between the floodplain bylaw and the agricultural exemption, because I don't think it's ever been addressed by case law, and I don't think any of the, the various permitting people are siloed and they don't talk. So I don't think we're gonna get any information there. So that's what I have. It's not a pretty picture, but I think, I think we'll know more after February 6th. We, d we definitely need to do something, get it voted as soon as possible. And I get this from Peggy Sloan all the time. You know, don't wait for the regulations, just get it enacted so you're, because you're, in case you need the flood insurance because you don't want to be in a situation where it's not. So I think going ahead is the safer thing to do. How we do that will require some skill. But I suppose we should find out if they're planning a special town meeting. So I'll just share my recollection of the public meeting or meetings we had on the draft new floodplain bylaw. It seemed to me that we got a fair amount of you know, skeptical questions slash pushback due to the, just our lack of ability to say how certain things would be interpreted. And what I yeah, hear is, right, you know, there's this sort of chicken and egg, like people are saying, well, we need to see the regulations. And, and I hear, totally understand that it's hard to really come up with final regulations until there's final bylaw. I would only observe that, you know, there's a pattern, there's a history of planning board putting a lot of effort into zoning changes 
going before town meeting and then having them shot down at town meeting because we've done a you know an inadequate job of education. So I'm very concerned, especially for a bylaw of this scope and impact, that if that I think we need to take serious, I would be afraid that if we do not take seriously the feedback related to regulations. Um, we're going to take this to a town meeting and get shot down again. You know, remember, I had to spend an hour at last town meeting just talking about the whole marijuana courier thing, which seemed so straightforward. And it, you know- Which wasn't, it seemed, and the objections weren't even on the involved know, with it. I know, so I'm just um, wondering- Actually, you know, it's this, well, it's funny because we hadn't had a problem with getting things adopted until very recently. And, but um, what we certainly have had lately. Um, maybe the thing to do is just start finding out what de minimis is or getting people to talk about. I'm not sure how, you need to sit down and spend some time with Scott Jackson, I think. Because I actually had thought that Hannah had spent more time with him than she has had. And I guess I'm also just to clarify hearing that you sort of see, well, maybe I'll ask the question, to what extent is the, the fact that we still have this old FEMA map and you know, unreliable promises of a new map coming, like how much is that a gating condition for us to make progress on the new bylaw? Like when do we decide we just hey, have to- Peggy, Peggy Sloan said, told me when I explained that rationale to her in, late November, she said, I think that's not a legitimate, I don't think that's a, a valid concern or I, I wouldn't worry about that. She said, all you have to do is submit the, change the title of the map in the bylaw, it's not a big deal. Hmm. Hmm. So I think we were we were hanging our hats on, on something that, that okay. she didn't think was a problem at all. Okay. So should maybe the resolution for tonight, given that we'll, and I'll be at that February 6th meeting as well on the, about the National Flood Insurance Program, but we well, should- Maybe you and I should talk after that and yeah. then get back to the rest of the group and see if we need to have a meeting before our regular February meeting. Yeah, so at least we should plan to have this on our regular February meeting agenda and we may, feel like we need to have an ad hoc meeting in February just on this topic. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That sounds good to me. Any other questions about the floodplain bylaw? Okay. Anybody else want to get involved? It's so much fun. Hey, look at what happened to California. Like, Good argument for having appropriate bylaws here to prevent uh, too much bad things happening if we get hit by a lot of rain. Okay, let's move on. Um, what I'd like to do, um, I want to talk about the solar bylaw revisions and the battery storage facility pieces together. But what I want to do, I want to start with something easy related to the solar bylaw that uh, Judy seen, but I'm again gonna share my screen. I've written this up. This is actually something we're going to need to do. Um, okay. And I have this document, Mary. I think I put this, I can get this document to you. It's in our OneDrive. But um, so there is an error in our solar electric generating facilities bylaw. There is a section. A typo. Go ahead. Okay. So this language is what currently appears in the bylaw. And I've used boldface to highlight where the garbled piece appears. If you read it, it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. Judy and I researched this and found that um, 
this garbled passage was introduced at the 2020 annual town meeting. The garbled section as I've highlighted here was in the town meeting warrant. And when the, cause we did something in 2020, like we amended the bylaw. The original bylaw was introduced in 2011, in October of 2011. But in 2020, we made a modification and in doing that modification, somehow, and we're not trying to figure out how this happened, but somehow this garbled passage got into the warrant. We voted on it at town meeting. This garbled passage appears in the minutes of the meeting, of the town meeting, where we approved it. And thus, this becomes, according to our town clerk, this is the language of record garbled, un unfortunately garbled. And it, the only way to correct it is by doing our usual procedure of amending the zoning bylaw, okay? Now in digging through, going back to the um, 2011 town meeting when this original bylaw was introduced, here is the original language. And again, I've used boldface to draw your attention to, hopefully, maybe if I make my screen just a little bit bigger. Um, Fine. If you can see the garbled part together with the ungarbled part, okay? And I even, I also talked to Nicholas Jones and he confirmed that, you know, it was re it's really very important to have this ungarbled language in there. So this seems like a very simple thing to do. We just have to go through the process. So I'm, I'm recommending that at our earliest opportunity, we um, you know, have a public hearing and you know, do the usual thing and restore the proper language for this section. Separate from any other changes we might want well, to Well, um, it we might revisit that. So maybe I, I can table this for the moment and maybe turn to this broader question. And this relates to the uh, the the letter from the Attorney General of 2012 that you circulated just earlier today, Judy, which I guess Mary will make part of our official record. So they I'll simply say that there's, a, there's an error in the current bylaw in this section that unless we're gonna delete it entirely from the bylaw should at least be corrected. And then we might have a question of strategy, like if we're gonna do revisions at town meeting, do we put several different changes all in one article or split them up. And I'm sensing from past experience that maybe breaking things up into multiple warrant articles might um, make things simpler and allow more things to pass. Um, anyway. No, I was, it was timing I was questioning. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess. Not, not we the format of the warrant, but the timing, because I was worried about too many public hearings and bills. Oh, sure. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing that. The broader agenda question, do we need in 2023 as a planning board to make any other changes to the solar bylaw? And that was influenced by what I had thought and apparently erroneously, I had thought that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts had only recently changed the section of the zoning law that pertains to solar facilities to have language saying we can only regulate based on basically public health, safety and welfare. I thought that was a recent change, but 
given Judy's, the letter Judy circulated, would it be helpful if I shared that letter that Judy sent around? Maybe it would be helpful if I give some of the background on the, okay. on the health, safety, and welfare. Yeah. Thank you. The, the exemption, the, the solar exemption, the solar bylaw exemption has been in the in the section 40A for long before 2012. And it was originally adopted when um, solar facilities were primarily small rooftop ones. And as there got to be these larger generating facilities, there was a question about, did it really apply to those or not? Because um, the, the wording, the actual wording of the exemption and, and the timing of it made people think that it was not. So in fact, the Department of Energy, I think it was the Department of Energy, published a pro forma a typical solar bylaw that communities could use that they felt would, would eliminate them from, would solve the problem of the exemption. And we followed that pretty well, or fairly well. We elaborated on it somewhat when we adopted ours. So we were definitely aware of that exemption at the time, but we were relying on this other, on this other bylaw. Now the case that um, precipitated what, what Grant is reacting to is not a change in the legis initiated by the legislature, but a, a um, court case where a community brought a case, sued a town for violation of this um, exemption. And the court case, and you've seen, you've had two summaries of it circulated, basically said that, yeah, this town did do that. And I guess it's the analysis of it is in, in the way you read it. Um, but they, what the court found was that this one town, I can't remember whether it was Waltham or Wenham or anyway, had so constrained its bylaw that there was essentially no part of town that, that it applied to, or only 2% of the town or a very small percentage of the town, that they had been so restrictive in the way they, they um, constructed their bylaw. And so the advice from Koppelman and Page was, um, you know, go back and, and think about what you've done, but, um, you know, especially pay attention to whether you, you have allowed enough space in your, you know, whether you feel you have, have provided adequate places for solar facilities is, is the message I got out of it, um, out of Koppelman and Page. And since we, I think among any town I know are fairly unique in not restricting solar to any particular zoning district or having overlay districts. Um, it seems to me that that's not a problem for us. And when I when I read the decision or a cop and, and I actually have a copy of the whole decision um, and I read Koppelman and Page, I didn't think we needed to do anything. I mean, we obviously have to be more aware of this um, court case and to be thinking about it certainly as, as we make changes and we may be vulnerable in a few of our provisions, but I don't personally see any need to, to change anything. Does that help? It is, that helps me a lot. So let me just make sure I heard clearly what you said. So first, use new information for me. I think what you're saying is that Waitley's solar bylaw was based on a model that was developed aware of this exemption. And mm -hmm. was so that 
so that there's good reason to believe that Waitley made a good faith effort to create its own solar bylaw that would be in compliance with you know, what I've highlighted here on the screen, that it would that the provisions were ones that the town felt were necessary to protect the public health, safety, or welfare. Well, we understood I, that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and also, the attorney general did approve it. That's right. This which is letter, the critical thing. Right. This letter did that came in on 2012 did from the attorney general did suggest that wait that town council be consulted on a number of points. And so to your recollection, Judy, were the attorney general's recommendations in that regard followed? Do we have any record of feedback from town council on these points? I don't think we've ever needed to. I mean, talking about implementation, that means when we review something, if we have a question, you know, when you have a specific project. And I don't think we've ever had had that kind of a question. Or in fact, if anything, our, um, the feedback we've gotten seems to be that we're too, we haven't been restrictive enough in implementing it, but at least okay. that's the way the townspeople seem to feel. Okay. And I think we've, we've, if anything, lapsed on this, on the side of being not overly restrictive. Mm -hmm. Especially we've, especially to do with screening and and depths of depths of uh, screening and things like that. Okay. I don't think we've had any trouble, basically. Okay. So that's what had driven my thought about putting this on the agenda. Did we need to make any requests of town council? Did we need to consider any new revisions in twenty twenty three? to ensure that our bylaw is consistent with the ex exemption. But I think what I'm hearing is that we're in good shape. Um, we have some, we've been reminded of a few things from this letter that would be relevant if we're uh, evaluating a future um, application, but no proactive um, yeah. revisions are needed at this time, which is sounds good. Well, the, the only change we would need to do is if we do or when we do the stop bad battery storage, we need to uh, refer <clears throat> the uh, solar to the the so, to the to battery storage. Yeah, because that's so where the question originally came up. Well, we do have a provision in. I mean, that's what that's a change we made in 2020 was to allow battery, battery storage within solar. Um, and in doing that, we created another problem um, because if you look at, and Brand and I've had an exchange on this, if you look in the table of use under, there's a section called non-residential uses at the end. And I think it was put in after the well pollution problem and it bans hazardous materials or on non-residential uses that involve hazardous materials in all zoning areas in town. And so what we did, unfortunately, I think when we put in the provisions about battery storage for solar facilities in 2020, um, we now have them allowed in solar facilities in one part of our bylaws and prohibited in another part which is a little bit uncomfortable. Hmm. So somehow we're gonna to have to reconcile that. Hmm. And I don't think that's, you know, if, if you're dealing with the health and safety, I mean, the reason for the hazardous materials prohibition is because of health and safety. So if that's what's really driving this, then I would think you take out the battery storage part of the solar bylaw, but that, that, that kind of obviates a need for a social, I mean, you wanna have the ability to generate, to have 
usable energy sources or renewable energy sources. So it's that's something I think we have to address by town meeting. And I'm not sure how we do it. And it's going to take a little thought. And, and I probably maybe want to talk about standalone battery grant because they're, yeah. the two are not unrelated. Right, right. And so I'm uh, just recently on an ad hoc town committee under the, I guess, the energy committee. Uh, we're working with the UMass Clean Energy Extension. They're doing a project with us on taking an inventory of solar um, resources in town and capacity for new solar facilities. And um, right now they're just doing an inventory. I think, I mean, this is ongoing work that I think will, I think be done summertime um, or by, I guess by the end of the academic semester. And one of the, I've seen an early draft of a report so far. I've already seen comments in this report about the potential advantages of deploying, well, first of all, having battery storage associated with solar facilities, number one, but also standalone battery storage not associated with solar because of the, the advantages for grid resilience and they've suggested some potential placements of standalone battery systems around town and municipal buildings. Again, early report, I've, had, I've submitted a bunch of questions to the UMass team about this, but it motivated me to go look at the solar bylaw and it I drew my attention to the fact that Right now, our bylaws don't seem to make any provision at all for standalone battery systems. That was They're deliberate. All, that yes. was very deliberate. And, and I do understand the concerns <laughs> about hazardous materials. And I've, I don't have a, an opinion about this. So I will simply, I really just wanted to socialize with all of you tonight that there's this ongoing project. It may lead to recommendations. I'm asking the UMass team if they, if they've they've looked at our solar bylaws as part of their projects. I'm going to see if they're going to offer any recommendations. Um, so we may come back to it, but they, a does would this team include uh, recommendations about protections? I can, I can municipalities. Um, I I think it would be helpful if if the report outlines a, a section on risks and things that communities might do to ameliorate those risks. If you remember right, the, the Chestnut Plain Road solar site uh, discussions and public meetings that were held around that, there was a large amount of opposition to the storage capacity, yes. the alone storage capacity there. Yeah. It was, it was an overwhelming negative response to that. Yeah. And it Huge. may be based in reality. There are articles about fires and stuff with different kinds of battery systems, though I'm not sure about the different chemistries in use. You know, there's also, you know, there's also been a lot of opposition to, in town, you know, to towns to all kinds of other things that may or may not be based in fact. I don't know the reality around battery storage. Well, there was a there was a pretty comprehensive uh, statement made by Neil Abraham, who um, Abrams, who knows his stuff. Okay. And, and he's, was, a phys, he's a physics professor. Okay. Yeah, he, um, he, he knows his stuff and he came out very strongly uh, against it. At this state of te the, the, the technology. Okay. One. Yeah. Well, at the time we did that, there were a lot of examples of <clears throat> lithium batteries blowing up in, in phones, uh, those little mopeds people are riding and stuff like that. So, right. right. <clears throat> yeah. There's a lot of. And fire, 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 just go, fire is a hazard. Just go through this process. Isn't there a paper that Amherst just went through this process for standalone storage? I believe they did, and I believe they put standalone storage at the border with near the border with Sunderland in North Amherst. So that's something to look at. Yeah. 
Yeah. The newspaper report said that they they had in addition, they outlined some of the protection criteria that they included. And it, it was interesting, one of them I thought that is not in our bylaw, um, they put a, a, some sort of a storage well underneath the pad so that if, you know, one of the dangers is that if there's a fire, the fire suppressant uh, is often water right. or includes water. And then you get the chemicals all down in the, in the aquifer, in the water table. And so water pollution is, is a key. Yeah, they had to add a provision for that. And I think that the, what they required was, was an enormous storage basin underneath the, the facility that would absorb all of, all of any runoff should, curbs around the, the thing that would catch it and channel it. Um, but, but an additional reservoir to, to make sure that, it, that, that any fire suppressant didn't get into the water table, which, which I find interesting. They weren't 100% comfortable with it, I don't think. They were the, the lady from the, I, I, I'll see if I can find the Gazette article. It was pretty, it was pretty informative. So I don't think I'm One making any I would... recommendation tonight that we pursue this, really just to let you know that there is this coming report that I'll share with the planning board. Does it sound like you're going to have anything for town meeting? Probably not. And, and I wasn't and allowing for, pub, for drafting and public hearings and everything. Yeah. And, and really, my intent in just having this discussion tonight was, well, it's January and you yeah. know, we're a planning board, we should plan and we could plan for this town meeting, we could plan for the second half of the year for next for 2024. Anyway, maybe to close this on solar. I know at the moment, based on tonight's discussion, I think I'm hearing we are we don't have any strong need or motivation to make any other changes to the solar bylaw, except perhaps Judy's intimating we need to think about this issue with the hazardous material well, or the inconsistency. That, well, I think we have to resolve that because it's a conflict. And then okay. I, um, I would like if if we wind up keeping the battery provision in the solar. I mean, one easy thing is just to take the battery part out of the solar, but I think that effectively means we wouldn't have any applications because I believe I believe that battery storage is required now for any large scale oh. system. Um, we could huh. check that. Um, hmm. One thing I think we should do is to preclude battery storage even in solar from the aquifer overlay district. Okay. That seems that certainly which we seems could wise. have done before and. Your well pollution talk woke me up to a lot of stuff, Tom. Well, if you can't store manure, and you certainly, <laughs> yeah, that's that's fairly benign compared to some of these materials. But I think we don't make that specific. We should that should that should be there if there if there's going to be any storage yes. at all, battery storage, any place in town. It, it, there should be a specific provision that it not be in the aquifer overlay district. Uh, Brent, before we move on, could you go back to the, um, the garbled paragraph for just a moment? Oh, sure. Okay, so this is the, this is the, uh, the desired original language time. Yeah, so the last sentence um, if, 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 if can can be um, what's it say? Above ground is if above ground is required, meaning you don't have to bury them. Um, what does if if required mean? I mean that so the company comes back. You say that it needs to be buried. The company comes back and says we require it, and that's that. It negates the, the, all the authority of the previous sentences. Shouldn't that be something like that? submit a, a waiver could be um, authorized by the planning board upon review 
something like that, as opposed to putting the decision making ultimately in the hands of the applicant and them determining if they were required or not. Tom, the, the big problem <clears throat> with this was that <clears throat> with the first few, we were told that you could not come in underground. It had to be on the three poles. And then we found out later that that's not true. That's right. It's just much easier for the utility companies. We, we put in, I, mean, I like your, I like your approach, Tom. We got, we thought we got around this problem before by putting in the explicit section there that, that allows us to hire an engineer to review, which was intended to document, to get proof of that. Well, there's, there's no, we don't, in that sentence, we don't set any standard to, to establish what required means. Required because they don't feel like it or required because they can't afford it. Required because of bedrock or something. No, I think it refers back to the requirement of the utility provider. So I think the, the way you maintain the authority for the planning board is to say that a waiver, waiver can be considered by the planning board upon the application of a, of a proposal or something to that effect. Tom is raising a good point. And in my discussions with Nicholas, he asserted that in the past, in past projects, the planning board had essentially just been run over by the utility companies who said, you yeah, know, we, we require it to be above ground. And the reality is it could have, could have been below ground, but it was going to cost them more money. It wasn't by the utility the companies. It was, it was the, the uh, applicants. Uh, yeah. The applicants, yeah, the applicants, yeah. correct. That's right. The utility provider was fine with it being underground, but to, to bury it, including the transformers, was going to cost monies that the applicant didn't want to spend. So I think Tom's got a great point that maybe if we're going to, well, we have to fix the garb, we should fix the garbled language. And this could be our opportunity to strengthen it. And that's my point. Well, we're, we're, when we're working on this paragraph, why don't we clean the whole thing up? Okay. And it's only, what, four sentences, five sentences? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think maybe since, why don't I get, I'll take this action and I'll, maybe I'll work with Tom and Judy to draft a few, um, you know, some, some other language and we can, bounce this around and then have a, at our next public meeting, talk about and refine it further. One suggestion is that you make it by the uh, permit granting authorities or whatever, or approval okay. authorities rather than planning board because the CBA yes. has a role here too. Right. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So that's all on solar. And the last piece has to do with cannabis social clubs because, you know, again, all I was doing is throwing some things out that I thought I heard about and wondering whether we need to do anything about this. Um, I let the MCTC know we were going to, you know, talk about this. So I'll give the floor to Jared in a second. But I did have a communication with our town administrator because. You know, I was sort of going off of rumor and I basically asked what, what kind of conversations has the town had about social consumption facilities in town? And, and I'll just share with everyone what I heard back about this. And then we can have a discussion and Jared can weigh in. So from our town administrator, he wrote that there's not been much in the way of conversation about social consumption with the select board. And the select board has not expressed a collective opinion on the topic. Right, so not much conversation, no collective opinion from the select board. Brian, the town administrator, has had conversations with the police chief, Chief Savine, about the topic. And the police chief continues to express concern about a potential increase in drivers operating under the influence of marijuana. And Chief Savine is also concerned 
about the absence of technology and a legal process to determine when someone is too intoxicated to drive, similar to a blood alcohol limit. So that's the sum total of what I heard from our before, town business. Before you get go further, um, what are you suggesting here or, or what's the goal of, of the discussion? Are we talking about I can answer that. <laughs> Do you want me to answer it or you? Yeah, go, go well, ahead. Well, I'm, I'm just, are, are we talking about adding a new bylaw, changing the existing one, leaving the existing one? Sure. Um, so the general spirit of all of these agenda items, you know, we often, our typical work in the planning board is very reactive. Things come in, we're reacting. So I just thought in January, we might have a little a discussion when our, we, we're not doing any active site review. Are there any things that we think as a planning board, we should be undertaking in the coming year? That was the spirit for all of these things, whether I had to do with battery storage or solar or anything like that. The, no, I understand that. No and expert. actually it's not a new topic. I thought you put this up there because I had raised it last year as something we should be discussing so I've yeah so really I wanted to ask the question do we feel like is there even some preliminary consensus on the board one way or the other about um, proposing either a change to our marijuana bylaw or an, an existing bylaw I did not come in tonight with a specific proposal is really just to take the temperature of the board, share some information about what I heard, if DMCTC has been having specific, I mean, we haven't yet, okay. oh, anyone fine. come come to us with a proposal for a change in bylaw and DMCTC could potentially do that if they were so inclined and they felt there was a need for it. So that was my intent, no more. Okay, thank you. Okay. And maybe that could be, this could be an opportunity to just ask Jared, since I see you're here, thank you for joining us. Um, you know, what is DMCTC thinking along these lines right now? Social consumption is you know, not permitted in the town of Waitley. Um, I'm not sure about that. You know, so Judy thinks it might actually be permitted. I was curious what Jared was going to say. Uh, so th there's, there is a particular license type called social consumption land. Uh, I believe there are six pilot towns that have been approved by the state to pilot this program. Um, so there's North Adams, Amherst, uh, Somerville, Provincetown, <coughs> Springfield. Um, and I think one more, maybe Cambridge, um, definitely Somerville. Um, and so our question, uh, we operate here, we're an entirely vertical cannabis company within the four walls of Waitley. Um, we're hoping to get our retail site approved at uh, 424 State Road. Um, and we would love to make it destination retail. We would love to make it, um, you know, a, an even more, um, vital, you know, attractive commercial space. And so we think having a uh, consumption lounge um, at, at that property um, would be an attractive thing. And so we're interested to hear from the town side whether that's a, a, a type of development, a type of commercial activity that would be attractive to the town. Um, so we, you know, now have had our second uh, year of cultivation. Um, we're looking at our third, our manufacturing is up and running and, and we're very excited to get uh, what we hope will be the first uh, retail dispensary open here. Um, and so we've really enjoyed working with the town and if the town would be open to it, we would love to explore this with you um, and see you know, what the benefits to the town might be and what the benefits to us might be. So it's really an exploratory conversation um, you know, and, and kind of taking the temperature 
uh, of of what might be possible. Uh, are you are the pilot programs actually operating? I don't you believe know? that there's anything up and ready in the state. So there's already the Summit Lounge, which operates in Worcester, and that seems to be something of a you know, a, a grandfathered in institution. There's some, yes. yeah, there's some regulations that allow that to operate. And so Judy, the, I mean, to your, uh, maybe the, um, what you were implying is that there may, may already be uh, ways to operate without that approval. I don't know whether that's the case. No, or no, not. I didn't mean that. I just, oh, okay. I, I meant, uh, I mean, if we are going to do something, then you would like to know have a feel for what reasonable regulations might be and, and yeah. how these work and how other people are doing things and like that. And I read a lot about, gee, they're starting these pilots and, and these are the approved communities and then I haven't seen anything. So I didn't Same. know if they, if they were where things are and if anybody had any experience to report or. So, I mean, just by kind of, um by by rumor and maybe it was northampton maybe that was the other town uh but by rumor i i've seen other uh retailers kind of preparing spaces even before um even before the regulations come through or the communities are ready to put forward bylaws um so you know i've seen um i think on king street uh the one that was used to be sakura um, I can't recall what the name of that one is. Uh, there's so many, yeah. They come uh, and go. Yeah, well, um, I, I think that they're preparing a lounge there. Um, you know, so, so you know, we, we, we want to move in, in, uh, in sync with the market. Um, and we think the site that we have would be, you know, an attractive one. Um, and, uh, you know, we would welcome a conversation with Chief Savine. He, he came and visited our offices there. And so we've, you know, we've just been kind of beginning to have that conversation with him. Um, and like him, you know, we would be very concerned about making sure that um, that testing was appropriate and that, you know, police was um, capable of administrating, administering sufficient testing to make sure that people were operating their vehicles appropriately, you know, and that all of the safety measures that would be required um, to keep the, the public safety, um, to be, keep the public safe, safe, um, you know, uh, that all that was in place. But as a practical matter, doesn't that have to come first? Um, to, to get those kind of laws on the books and regulations on the books and standards, that, that seems to be, to be a lengthy process that the planning board can't get in front of and um, it, it can only follow them. Well, there are state laws now allowing social smoking clubs, but it was my impression that they could not be located in the same place where sales were going on. So it can't be in the same, um, it can't be the same property that is, so the way that our property works is it's condoized. So DMC only leases studs in at that site. Right. Um, so it's a, it's a different property. I mean, it's a different unit on that same site yes. that would be proposed for the um, would be proposed for the, the social consumption lounge. Okay. So, so the you other would need a, a separate. So it's it's a different. It's the same address, but a different building. Right. Um, it's a different unit number. So like in a in a multi tenant, you know mall say it could be the same tax parcel but a different building or a different you know unit on that same parcel i'm not entirely sure that our current uh bylaw doesn't permit permit this because it doesn't say anything about not consuming on on site hmm. I, th I think that's I, the state law though judy well no consumption I, on site Yes, but I guess um, Brant was implying that we needed to allow the the use yeah. as a special use, and I honestly don't know whether that's the case or not. But but it doesn't preclude 
it doesn't preclude consumption on site, whether it. Hmm. We, so we may need to consult with town council about whether it does or not. Um, I'm a bit uncomfortable about leaving. If if that's the case, I'm a bit uncomfortable about not doing anything because then we wouldn't we would need some regulations to go presumably go with it. But so what's the current state of affairs? Could someone come into Waitley and establish a social club independent of any other process? Or is it prohibited somewhere? Well, that's well, the I question. Does, does the current does the current retail, it says retail consumption, but it doesn't necessarily say that it can't be on site. We so must I definitely don't know, can't consume at, at our site. I mean, we definitely cannot consume inside the dispensary. Um, that is, yeah, but, yeah, no, I understand that. But if, if say, somebody walked into town and wanted to do one on, I don't know, in the center school, well, that in a in a part of town where it would be zoned allowable, could they do it under the re, under the retail marijuana bylaw or not? Is the question, and I don't separate separate because it doesn't preclude, it doesn't say no consumption on site. I think it's very much worth, if not necessary to ask town council for an opinion about this. I would be very concerned if social consumption could be established under the existing bylaw because the implications of that were not thought through at the time the bylaw was. Well, that's that's why I raised the issue last okay. year because yeah. I was worried that it was allowed. Um, it's it's one thing if I mean, at least there's some protection that you can't do it in an existing dispensary. So if you've got a dispensary approval, then you can't do it. So you'd be starting from scratch. So somebody would knew, know that that's what you're intending. But still, we don't have any any protections in the bylaw. And I honestly, at this point, don't know how to even think about drafting them. I mean, the simple thing would be to say, well, as long as they obey the state rules, but, you know, it's hard enough to get the enforcement of our zoning bylaws when they're in the bylaw, let alone when they're not. And I don't know the extent to which, I don't really think the state has staffed to, to, um, enforce every every minor violation of a by, of a regulation could, so could you could you reiterate the concern because I, I i i worry that i'm not catching it exactly we we developed the bylaws for retail on the assumption that it was a store and people would take the stuff and go home yes someplace else and use it and that's the way the bylaw is drafted. Yes. Uh, if in fact it is broad enough as it is written, so that it includes consumption on site. Yeah. Then, then the rest of the bylaw is inadequate because it I doesn't see. it doesn't envision that. And I I don't and, believe that that's allowable under the current. Bylaw. Well, it's right. it's not allowable if you are permitted for a dispensary. What I don't know is if you walk in and say, "I want to do a social club," and and that's just that's just selling on site. I just you, need, you can't sell cannabis unless you have a you know unless you have a social consumption license, and you, those aren't they're not being well, that's, granted. That's, that's the state regulation. Yeah, maybe I'm not, uh, maybe I'm not following. I think yeah. what you, what I think I hear Judy saying is that when our zoning bylaw was written, there was a certain intent not to include or make allowances or permit social consumption. However, it, it didn't these, exist. It wasn't a, it wasn't a use. It, it wasn't even an issue. But, but now in today's world, today's, at this time, there is a, a an open question as to whether 
There is an interpretation of weight rezoning bylaw that would permit an applicant to say, hey, I'm going to open up a social consumption facility in town. Here's my site plan. It's consistent with your bylaw. So we need to resolve that. The only issue this is that like the, the inverse of the indoor marijuana thing. Our bylaws said one thing with one with one implicit definition, the state right. bylaw, state regulations had a different definition. Um, so they're, they're, uh, they start, they're enforced separately, put it that way. Well, I just, they're, they're additive. <laughs> hey, I just, uh, I'll I'll use the same place vocabulary. called Leafly uh, on the web, and it states that the state cannabis control in Massachusetts on Monday, unanimously approved policy allowing the establishments where patrons would be able to purchase cannabis products and consume them on site. So this is brand new. It's on a site called Leafly. My, my understanding was that they were only issuing consumption lounge licenses in the pilot towns, that the state would not grant us, for instance, a social consumption license in Wheatley because Wheatley is not one of the six pilot uh, towns. And until the, ta the state sees that the pilot uh, towns and pilot enterprises are operating safely and effectively, nobody could get a license in, in Wheatley. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. I think that's true too. But what I'm saying is that it may be something that's going to come up relatively soon well that's why i asked whether they were actually operating it or not because yeah right yeah so we need to we need to clarify that with town council great our, our we need to clarify our bylaw with town council and see great and jared i guess what i would say is if it came if we arrived at a time where the waitley planning board needed to consider a new zoning bylaw or an amendment to accommodate social consumption. Uh, and I will preface what I'm about to say with, I'm, I try to work hard to always keep an open mind. I would just say right now, based on not a lot of information. So I need, you know, but I'm, I feel like I have these concerns. I think the things that I heard about from the police chief I, I feel very comfortable with the idea of somebody going to a, a retail operation um, and, and bringing a product home for them to use at home. And that I can mm -hmm. assume, perhaps wrongly, that in the travel from the purchase, point of purchase to their home, they're not under any influence where they could be a danger. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of my assumptions may be naive. Like I said, I haven't thought this all through, right? But I, just my initial reaction is allowing for social consumption would raise a lot of questions for me. Like how could we be, how could we be confident that patrons leaving those establishments have the wherewithal to operate a vehicle safely or, you know, and I'll just leave it there. Like if well, we're well, going to have those think, discussions, I think that's going to be a big this, issue for me. Doesn't this raise the question then, where does the authority lie? I mean, if you wanted a liquor license in Waitley, you wouldn't come to the planning board. Um, looking, looking for what, what's your closest model to this, it would be a, a liquor license type environment. Yeah. Um, so is, it, is this even into conversation for the planning board or is this something, is this a select board issue? Yeah. I think. I don't know. I was I was trying to figure out how you get a consensus of what the how the town feels, and which is what Jared's trying to do. And and I think maybe the it would be nice to have a poll somehow, but I don't know who takes that or who does it. Or or I think our job is if the town wants it, we should figure out a way to do it healthily, responsibly. Not, yeah. 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 Responsibly is the right word. Thank you. Gee, you want to be on the planning board, Terry? I very much do. I I, I love watching these things. <laughs> Where do you live? I, I I have lots of property here now. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, it's, it's your residence. Animals yeah. Knows. yeah. 
just well, couldn't. You'd I, I have to excuse yourself from all the interesting things you did yeah, to yourself. Yeah. Um, so I guess what I'm hearing, what I guess I'm hearing is like, like, and I again, I didn't come in with a, 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 a you know, waving the flag that we ought to do this. Do you think, Judy, we should get a town council opinion about what our what our current bylaw might permit, even though what I'm also hearing is that there's no immediate risk because the state will not allow an establishment to be. Well, I think we ought to know because it it um, it's these things have a way of catching catching up on you. So, and it's going to take some time to put this in place because we're starting from zero. Yeah. I mean, yeah. with with the dispensaries. There was it was a little more straightforward because the medical ones had been around for a while and um, and the medical ones were were much more controlled and and we worked into it gradually. This this is a whole new playing field. And so one, I think we ought to know and 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 then we might want to have a couple of weapons in our quiver. Just, you know, maybe if in fact it turns out that our current bylaw does, we might want to ask for a, a moratorium for a period of time just to evaluate so that it gets done responsibly. Um, I, I would think that would be a good thing. And then take the time to try and study up on the pilot programs and how they work and what the regulations are and keep abreast of the state regulations and figure out what we can do. But in all of these things, it's like the solar bylaw. We were the first ones in this part of the world to do it. And we learned a lot with the, the pioneers are the ones who get the arrows in the back. You know, and it's, it's painful, it's painful. Yeah. So, but yeah, I'd start with town council. And then if in fact we, it currently would be possible, then I would advocate for a like a 12 month moratorium or something, just just so we can do it responsibly. Or 12 months from the end of the pilot period or something, maybe like that. All right. So Judy, are you going to follow up? I guess we, we access town council through the town administrator, is that right? Yeah, I'll I'll follow up with that. We need okay. to circle back to the DLTA too. Yes, that's right. Um, okay, well then maybe this is the right time to get back to the DLTA before we talk, talk about zoning violation fees, which would be straightforward, I think. So I think then based on everything I've heard in the discussion so far, where we, we, we don't need DLTA, well, I take it that we had DLT, DLTA money last year to do floodplain related stuff. Do we potentially need additional money to do more? Or are we good on the floodplains? No, I think what, where we are now, um, the the stuff FERCOG can help us with. They've done pretty much, okay. and they will do minor changes to the to the bylaw with with just the normal zoning help. So that's not okay. an issue. Okay, and so I don't so think I we need anything on solar. And, we're, and we've discussed this social consumption of cannabis. So it really does seem like the subdivision regulation review has floated to the top and would be a great, I mean, I'd love help. I mean, I'd be interested in working on that project, but I, you know, not from a blank slate. I move that as our request. I second that. Would you give me something con concise to write on that motion? Um, we request for our DLTA project, our, our project would be to request from FERCOG a, an analysis of our current subdivision regulations <clears throat> and make recommendations about changes Changes to be made. Hold on, please. I can't go that yeah. fast. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, 
I missed the last half of it all. I, I don't want to make you repeat everything, but no, uh, okay. To request from FERCOG an analysis of our subdivision regulations and recommendation of changes. Slow Here down, Trudy. Slow down, Trudy. <laughs> An analysis request an analysis of our subdivision regulations and recommendations for changes. And yes. Okay. Hey, did you guess who was the second on that, Mary? Uh, no. Brian. <laughs> Okay, Judy moved and Brent seconded. Correct. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for a voice vote. Don, yes. Sarah? Yes. Judy? Yes. Brent? Yes. Hi. And Tom, sorry. And uh, the motion is unanimous and carries. So Judy, you'll do a draft and I can help you do that? Sure. <coughs> I'd love to see that, how that's done. Okay. I don't think it's as, it, it's, it's not as, as uh, arduous. Oh, come on, sex it up. It's, it's one of the greatest experiences of your life. <laughs> The whole secret is to indicate as many places that it hits their priorities as possible. But okay. I think Sounds they will, good. the select board will always try and do one from the planning board, I think, so. Okay, well, we'll let's, we can move on, Don, to zoning violation fees. Okay. okay. Take, that, take that as a yes. Okay, so yes. we received a citizen request from a citizen who's also a member of the select board, Fred Barron, that the planning board consider um, revising our zoning bylaws to increase the per offense fee for zoning bylaw violations from the current $50 per offense to the state maximum of $300 per offense. And I'll remind everyone that our bylaw it do, does, and this is permitted by state law, allow um, offenses that, that persist over multiple days to be treated as each day as an additional offense. So that if you violate the bylaw on Monday and again on Tuesday, those are two separate offenses for the same, same violation. And as long as you continue to violate the bylaw, you can rack up these offenses, all right? Now, the motivation was to increase the deterrence that the, our zoning code places on zoning violations, right? Now, um, I'll give you a little bit more background before we have a discussion about whether we're going to do this and if so, how. Um, I reached out to our building inspector to ask Jim from his <coughs> perspective on zoning violations and fees and so forth. So one perspective I got from Jim was, well, you know, um, the zoning violations are um, the fees are rarely um, charged because once, first of all, there's a process involved in determining that there has been a violation. Of course, Jim is the zoning enforcement officer, handles that. But then once a violation has been determined to be, have occurred and perhaps be occurring, the zoning enforcement officer is in no position to levy fines. Now the town must bring a claim to superior court for enforcement. So there's a legal process that has to play out when a zoning violation has been identified. That takes time, that takes money per 
Jim, Superior Court often tries to send these things to mediation so that they're actually never, you never get to a point where fees are charged. So from one perspective, feedback from the zoning enforcement officer was, well, you know, it rarely happens and whatever, it, whatever the fee is probably is gonna make no difference. Now, Fred Barron, our selectman, um, who suggested the idea in the first place, had an, another, I think, valid perspective, which is, well, you know, first of all, putting, maybe I should actually, it would be better if I um, referred to Fred's actual words. Um, he said, even if it turns out that fines are effectively unenforceable, raising the legal limits for fines can send a message that we take building code violations or zoning violations seriously. And sending a message is worthwhile. Um, the current maximum is not really a deterrent for willful violations. And he suggested that if we do raise the per offense fee to the state maximum of $300 per offense. Um, even if enforcement is challenging, that in itself, the, the, you, we've now changed the, the financial dynamics, you might say. It might now become more cost effective for the town to go to court for enforcement because the, um, what it could gain from so doing could cover court costs and, and things like that. So it, it might change the economics around enforcement. So I thought that was also an interesting and valid perspective. So thoughts on raising- There's one piece, one piece that you didn't mention is that when there's a zoning violation, I believe the building inspector has the authority to issue a cease and desist order. That's true. Which to me seems like a much more immediate and painful threat than, than the fee. And I think it's the real deterrent. I don't know enough about the status of those. Like again, what's what happens if somebody ignores a cease and desist order? Again, do we get to a- Well, I think uh, then the, the constable comes and locks the facility or something. It's, uh -huh. it's this, this is serious stuff. <laughs> so is it, do you feel like there's no need for the board to raise that per offense fee from 50 to $300? It does sound like it could actually wind up costing the town more money than it takes in on the fine. How so? I guess I, I would want to consult with the people who would have to implement it before we did anything. Well, the, fee, the lawyer, legal fees, I mean, we're not going to take it to Superior Court. Somebody else, is, the lawyer is going to have to do that. The mediator okay. costs money. Right. Um, and depending on how long this is, this would, something like this would drag on, it could wind up costing more than the, the offset money. Yeah. Yeah. As Fred says, it might be worth doing just, just as a as, as a emphasis kind of, you know, as, as a perception thing, but um, as a practical matter, I don't think it is at all. And Do we know also, what? I don't know. I know that other, other fees were taken out of specific bylaws so they didn't have to get voted at town meeting all the time. I wonder whether this ought to be one of them. But I think the other fees tended to be more often levied, so <laughs> license fees and things like that. But I did put that question to Brian, and I haven't gotten an answer, so I think I just have to follow up with him again as to whether. Well, it's I don't know. Yeah, I guess I come down that it's probably a nice thing to do, but I don't. I think it's. Um, I would want to check with with the people who would have to implement it and see how they feel about it. When was the last time a zoning violation was charged? To... We did a cease and desist on the, uh, on the brewery on Chestnut Plain Road. And that lasted only two days. Um, and then we had a meeting and 
resolve things, but. Uh, yeah, we've done, there was no, no, does this happen quite frequently, I think, or, or happen anyway. I don't. There, but there was, there was no fine on that. It was just a cease and desist. And that's the only cease and desist I remember at the time I've been on the board. I think there've been a couple others that had to do with um, stuff not necessarily ridiculous. projects we were as closely involved with. I'm still trying to find out whether, you know, again to your question, Tom, about that issue with the um, the blasting company on Chestnut Plain Road. Um, and I don't know. I've seen a few emails, but it sounds like there have been assertions made of zoning violations, but I don't know that it's been adjudicated that way. I don't believe there's been any cease and desist. Um, the building inspector found that their activity was consistent with the special permit that they had. Uh huh. Okay, well, I was of multiple, at least two minds about this proposal from Fred about raising it. One that setting a, just since there is a state maximum, I, it seemed like maybe, maybe there's a good reason for us to be consistent with the state. But then I also thought that if we bring this in front of town meeting, there could be perhaps reasonable pushback from people concerned that if, if through some mistake or whatever, they commit a zoning violation, um, that suddenly they, there is, um, you know, that they are at a lot of financial risk. Now, again, that one could take the position, well, they shouldn't have done that in the first place, blah, 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 but I can imagine, um, citizen opposition to us drawing attention to the fact that, oh, well, there's a fee at all, that it's per offense. And I don't know, I'm curious how other people on the board feel about how, how the town might react to raising something to like $300 per offense, which could be a daily fee. Is this a sleeping dog we just leave that lie? Sounds... I'm not particularly comfortable with that. I uh, lived off and on in Waitley my whole life, and uh, it's never been that kind of town. Mm -hmm. Sarah? Huh? Well, what, what, where are we? What, what are you looking for, Brad? Well, I'm just really looking for your feedback. So the we have been asked. He wants to know. He wants a go or no go. Yeah, really. We've been asked by the select, a member of the select board, a citizen of Waitley, to consider raising this fee from $50 to, you know, up towards two or towards the state max, or raising it by some amount. We're doing, you know, so I'm respecting that request. We're having a conversation. Do we, we it may be our, combined opinion that $50 per offense as it stands is satisfactory. Is that what we think? Do, do, do you know if, I mean, we've just had a pretty good conversation about this. Do we know if Fred understands the nuances and the, and the, the application of this, the way we just discussed it and, and revealed, or is, is it just, is it a, just a raise it three to $300 without this knowledge? It seems, the climate in the country, and I think um, Judy referred to this before trying to get things through town meeting. Would this have to go before town meeting? I'm sure it's a zoning change. And we need a two thirds vote. And so, um, if it's in the bylaw, it, you know, it's a case of keep your powder dry. Um, do, you, do you want to spend planning board goodwill for, for this where we're feeling? Well, it's not going to make much difference anyway, you know, go ahead, but you know, it's, it's, there's really no substance to it. 
and use and bring that before town meeting with that somewhat unenthusiastic backing and then use up the goodwill of the community trying to defend it. I mean, is Fred, is Fred aware of, of this con the depth of this conversation? I can't say I know what Fred is or is not aware of about this. I think we have larger things to argue to try to, I mean, just we've got to get the floodplain bylaw through. So this is not something that, this is already taking up more of our, of our very expensive time. Oh, did you get a raise? <laughs> and I mean, yeah, it's just, just going to exponentially it. go on just from here. Taking our a lot of time. Yeah. Okay. I'm fine with all of that. I felt we needed to have this conversation. But I think it's important for Fred to know that, that there was a thoughtful conversation behind this, and this is why this lacks enthusiasm. It's, it's not because we're blanketly opposed to the idea that just as a practical matter, it doesn't just it doesn't seem worthwhile to go forward with this. It seems punitive to me, and that's not our job, I don't think. Okay, I think you've all given me. Uh, enough raw material so I can get back to Fred since I've been having that conversation with him separately by email it's I feel like I should run this to ground so I will I will do that okay um, I think it's about time that we uh, look at the minutes and approve them we should and I believe there might be one additional item not anticipated that I got via chat. But so the order is we're gonna do the approval of the minutes and then we'll see if there are any additional items not anticipated. Um, great minutes, Mary. <laughs> Thank For you. November 29th. I did um, put in the, uh, Judy sent a couple of comments in an email. I withdrew one of them. I withdrew one of them. Oh, okay. I did a couple of little edits. Let me, my, I think nothing substantive. Let me just see if I, I put in the meeting folder for 11. So I, I, I must admit, I didn't check any of your numbers in the calculations, Mary. So I assume that those are all in Well, a lot, a lot of those, you know, I, I went by what I had in my notes, but I did refer also to uh, oh, I, the document I'm that sure we had did. up on screen <laughs> um, that everyone was looking at while he was talking about it. Um, I, I certainly didn't get to write all of that down either, but uh, I stuck- No, no, I, I, was, I was kidding. I you were mostly kidding, yeah. <laughs> um, about Lisa's comments, I checked the video on that and it it was the, the you don't remember some of this stuff because she didn't start giving her comments until just after you left to go to the plant to oh, give okay, your presentation fine, fine. thank and so, you and uh, yeah they they all yeah you know, i would stand by what i put in it's just that you weren't there okay, to hear great it. great because i i did leave early i'd forgotten that yeah but just on that, that point so that, that case on 71 Chestnut Plain Road has been resolved and the, there's no longer a review of that project. project. So there's a, lot, there's a lot of confusion about this, right? this what's going on. I, I just, you're talking about my comment? The, the approval of the, the issue is really whether The building inspector determined some time ago that the special permit that they had uh, covered this project. Nobody believes that. And so. Okay. And so that's that's the issue. It's it's kind of like Monahan's. It's a festering sore because uh, the building inspector's decision doesn't seem to square with reality. Or isn't, it doesn't square with what, what people are perceiving. And um, I don't believe he's actually even been up to the fight as of 
six weeks ago, and he hadn't been up to the site, so I don't know. Thank you. So I mean, I Lisa's concern was where is the material, film material coming from, and what does it consist of? Because they're in the aquifer district. And and the wear and tear on the road and the trucks and the fact that this, you know, it would appear that whatever they're doing shouldn't be consistent with a special permit because it's obviously changing the nature of the business quite a bit. Well, it looks like because they're, the, the reason they would be bringing in more fill would be to make berms around more bunkers. So I don't know if there's a size restriction on that or not. I guess I could pull the... Uh, well, we, we are doing, a, hold on, hold on, please. We're doing it's approval of minutes and now we're <laughs> off on side conversation. It's, it's not, there's no, it's out of our hands. We can't do anything. Thank you. Let's just get, do the, I just wanted, I made a little edit to her minutes that I just thought you all should see. These were the conditions of approval. Um, I just basically changed clarified the numbering um, because there is a parenthetical. I'll just show you the. the I'm going to write this down while you've got it up, if that's okay. And it's, you can, Mary, but it's in the meeting. I, I know. I, I have, I'm Feel having, free. I'm having problems okay. accessing the things in OneDrive. Right. And, and, and I can I, always email it to you, but feel free to write it down. I, what I did is instead of having the condition, the, this first item here, mm -hmm. unquote, condition number one, it's really just a preface. So I just removed number one from this piece and then the renumbered the next four, one through four. Okay. That's the only substantive change I made to the minutes. And everything else I can find. Okay, and 2020 on that first line is underlined. No, 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 that's just the word that's... checking thing. Okay, it's okay. Not actually underlined. I'll ignore that then. Ignore that. Yep, yep, yep. So Maybe. is is there anything else that's additional to what? Uh, is there anything else additional that, that needs to be changed the way it is now? I put a period right here that was missing, Mary. After restrictions. I think periods and formatting can, can be done outside the yes. board's yeah. approval process. Oh, I... I moved so the minutes I, be, I, be approved without any I just of the Second Seconded. Second, third. Mary, I will email you this document. And would you also please email me the document from the beginning of the meeting tonight? That's also you, you in You should have gotten it by email from me this afternoon. I don't know if we're talking about the same document. Oh, the AG letter? I, I, I have an AG letter that but this oh. seemed like it had had an earlier date on it. Well, the one we were looking at tonight was from 2012 and the one yep. that Judy mailed most recently was uh, the, the recent one, I think. I've got yep. the recent one. Recent but I, the one I, I sent, I said, I sent out one around 4.30 this afternoon, did you? Oh, I, I was not home to check that. Yeah. Maybe so it's that's... there. So what, so what you it. mailed is what we looked at tonight. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you then I've it. got, I should have that then. Yeah, you should have that. And I'll email you the document that I showed that had the garbled paragraph of the soil. Yes, document. that's what I need. The, <laughs> I need the garbling. <laughs> I, I will do that. Because we'll definitely have to resolve that. Okay. All right, all this discussion is out of order. <laughs> well, I need to know. <laughs> it's still up to do with the minutes. I'm calling the question. <gasps> John, aye. Sarah. Aye. Brent. Aye. Tom. Aye. The motion passes. <laughs> Judy. Wait, Judy. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Ah, Judy. He's after us, Judy. Hi. Okay. The ayes have it unanimously. Okay. Any additional items not anticipated? I think we've beat that. Well, well Jared, you know? I think, did want to raise some things. And I think we can treat this as like an open floor moment here. Can't promise we're going to do anything about this, Jared, but yeah. we're here and we're listening. I, I, I appreciate that. And I, you know, if this is the inappropriate, uh, in an, an inappropriate forum, I, I respectfully will, uh, I'll, I'll certainly respect that. Um, so so a, a question I had was on um, the zoning in which cannabis manufacturing is permitted. And my suggestion, um, if I may, is that um, just as you guys place restrictions on um, or, or shape the way that activities may be done for cultivation, that there are certain man cannabis manufacturing activities that seem really low, uh, low risk and low intensity. So things like processing, filling, capping, solventless extraction, you know, things that don't require a C1D1 booth or a C1D2 booth. You know, salt. You know, no, no flammable materials. Those, those kinds of activities, in at least where I sit, seem appropriate or amenable for commercial uh, zoning. Um, so there are commercial buildings, commercial areas in Wheatley in which that activity might be reasonably done. Um, and currently, the bylaws don't allow. Uh, cannabis manufacturing in commercial zones. They're allowed in industrial uh, and in, I believe, industrial commercial. Um, and so my my suggestion is that, um, I, and I'm not, you know, I'm not expecting that, you know, full-on manufacturing uh, be done in a commercial zone, but that uh, what I'm, you know, might call like light cannabis manufacturing activities could be done and that there might be carve outs for the types of activities that are in inbound and types of activities that are out of bounds. And I'd be happy to um, describe or show you um, at our facility what I think ought to be in and what ought to be out. Perhaps you could send us a written description of- I, I would be happy to. I would be happy to that do that. That would be a good place to start. Fantastic. Okay. And Great. also- in any information you have about other towns and their zoning. Okay. Fantastic. And just to let you know, Jared, uh, almost all of the commercial uh, property is along Route 5, which is also residential, yes. along Christian Lane, which is also residential. So there yes. might, be some, might be some pushbacks. And so that's exactly what I'm trying to be sensitive to yeah. is you know, having a bomb, you know, having highly flammable material. Uh, in that kind of an area is probably not, probably not an appropriate thing. Um, right. But having, you know, solventless, which is just ice water, ice water extraction, you know, that seems, you know, there's no risk. There's, there's really no risk. Um, uh, you know, there's risk of, you know, I guess the ice water spilling. Um, it, it, it just, they're, they're much lower touch kinds of activities, filling and capping. It's yes. just, you know, it's regular kind of assembly work. Um, you know, um, so anyway, but I'm happy to describe that at, at greater length and, and to provide uh, videos and, and whatever, whatever you'd want. Yeah. Well, I think, it's, I think it's a good idea, but I know that there are going to be a number of neighbors is not going to think it's a good idea. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so cultivation is allowed in commercial areas, um, you know, and that certainly produces more, more odor than, or has the the possibility of producing more odor than uh, manufacturing. Um, so for what that's worth. Yep. A lot of Great. puritanism still around. Okay. Certainly. I Certainly. And I would just say, I'd encourage you to include definitions of terms that lay people yes. like me don't know, like I'm not sure what capping is. And, you know, anyway. Yes. Great. Great. I, I will provide videos so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Great idea. Yeah. Great. Cool. Thank you guys. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Take care. Budget. Are we do we need to address anything with budget? Or are we good? 
Budget is taken care of for 2024. And I will, and I will, has somebody paid that bill that I dropped off, signed on Veterans Day on November 10th? How do we know if they got it on the warrant? I'm going to have to I think contact the accountant about one for the ZBA. I'll ask her about it. Did you ever get this? Did it reach I mean, you? I, what is the? What else can I do? They want a wet yeah. signature, <laughs> which means I can't scan. I can't get it directly into the email of the people who need it with an electronic signature because no. they won't allow that. The, the, it's, I'm, I'm not sure myself that. It, is there supposed to be a mailbox for her at town offices in Waitley? I, I, I looked on the website and I found a phone number for her, but not email. So even talking to her is a little bit. <laughs> Hannah happened to be there. And I said, what do I do with this now that I signed it? And she said to put it into the assistant town clerk's box, who was out that day because that was their holiday. Yeah. So I put it in the bin by her door. Well, I don't know. <laughs> That, that may not have worked. I'll, 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 I'll get to the bottom of it anyway. And Okay, I'm sorry. I'm trying you, to you make sent it me the, the, You emailed me the stuff, you know, recently when I asked about it. And if, if maybe that'll, maybe I can send her that and say, does this look familiar? Did you get the, the paper copy with the wet signature on this? And what's the status? Or, you know, have you never heard of this yet? <laughs> I, I can't put account numbers on because I don't know where those funds were deposited that go against the expenditure. But yeah. she's got to know that. Well, I, I asked uh, I asked for that information uh, the other day, and I I got back numbers, but I'm not quite sure which ones go in that slot. Uh, I'll figure it she's out. She's a decent and, town accountant; she'll know anyway. Okay, so we're, that. we're gonna. Right. We're going to adjourn and you guys can continue talking. Yes. No, I'm good. Dinner time. Okay. Is, this, is this Dara you're talking about? Dara is Both great. Do adjourn. So, yeah. It is, it's, Dara is wonderful. Do I have a second? Good. <laughs> Bye, Don. Bye -bye. Do I have a second? All right. Do I have oh, yeah. a second? We'll stop recording. Oh, yeah. I seconded it, Don. Whatever it was. <laughs>